Um, I'm Jose Aleman, I'm one of the editors in chief of the Stanford Journal of International Law. And uh, I would like to introduce, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce really one of our two uh, keynote speakers for this afternoon, um, Dean Elizabeth Rinska Parker. She's, uh, she just stepped down as Dean of the Pacific McGeorge Law School in 2012 here in California where she was Dean for 10 years um, after serving as a general counsel of the University of Wisconsin. Um, Dean Parker has, uh, combines a career in, uh, as a practitioner in the intelligence community as well as her uh, deanship and academic interest in national security law. So I thought she would bring a really interesting perspective on, how, on these two questions that we've been uh, grappling with. On the one hand, uh, are intelligence agencies properly organized, empowered to tackle uh, to, to, per, to perform their mission and tackle uh, transnational threats. And on the other hand, are they doing so, are the mechanisms in place for them to do so, abiding by the rule of law and our constitutional guarantees? Um, Dean Parker served as general counsel of the National Security Agency from 1984 to 1989. She was a principal deputy legal advisor at the US Department of State from 1989 to 1990 and general counsel for the Central Intelligence Agency from 1990 to 1995. Uh, she was reappointed in 2012 uh, to the Public Interest Declassification Board by to her third term in the Public Interest Declassification Board. And something interesting that I find about her career is that she began her legal career in, the, in civil rights and community law, which I think it's, it's gonna provide for an interesting uh, perspective on her uh, views on intelligence so uh, without further ado, uh, Dean Elizabeth Rinska Parker. Well, thank you very much, Jose, as I move to the podium here. It's a good thing to have a microphone because I used to say in the old days, the way I protected the nation's secrets was by, by, by being inaudible. Um, <laughs> my voice doesn't carry. Um, you know, this has been a very rich conference, and I've learned a huge amount. I can set it down. And I thank you for all your work in organizing it, and Alan Weiner for fingering me <laughs> for this position. Um, you have, however, among you one whose sandals I am unworthy to unclasp in Chris Ingalls. And I just thought I'd, Ingalls, I thought I would share a story I shared with him as I begin. Uh, Jose's done his homework. Not everybody introduces me with reference to my early civil rights background. Um, but that figures into what I'm about to tell you, and then I'm going to go to some more prepared remarks. It was in 1992 that uh, an invitation to speak to a Hastings alumni group coincided mercifully with the end of the first Gulf War because students had begun protesting CIA on campus um, in my presence. and. I said to the dean, well, you know, if the students are interested, I'd be happy to speak with them, too. He said, you do that? I said, well, yeah, why not? Uh, that's what my job is, I think. He insisted on picking me up in a car that had an armed guard, suggesting the level of concern. And I <clears throat> agreed at a group of students in an auditor or a classroom not unlike this, and I gave them a few, as we say in the intelligence community, groups, a couple of paragraphs on what my office did. And I said, now to the questions, that's really my uh, interest here. And there was a young woman, an African-American, right in that chair, and she raised her hand. You couldn't avoid asking her what her question was. And she said, tell me, have you been, or were you undercover in 1970 when you represented the NAACP? <laughs> well, I mean, I have to tell you that the muse will visit only in a panic like that. And I said, uh, no, I've never represented anybody in a context where I was undercover ever, or will I, after this visit. But I said, you figured it out. I have made a career of representing unpopular causes. And I think some of you think I've gone too far this time. Well, they laughed, and that was helpful. But the fact is, you're also probably going to think I've gone native. That said, um, Jose has made a challenging assignment of this, and the comments already uh, delivered have made it even more difficult. What can I add that would further inform the discussion? And so I, I've debated here all morning as I took notes. Well, shall I simply uh, give you 
uh, responses to the 12 issues I've identified, or shall I stick with my prepared remarks? I'm going to try and do both. It's a dangerous course. Lock the door. It may take longer than what we've planned. But in any event, let me begin by saying that when we come to the question, what are the appropriate power and limits of modern intelligence in a time of transnational threats, Shirley Hazard gives me the guidance I need. Famously, she can be quoted, or she has been quoted as saying, it takes time to know what we think. And I, for one, have not had enough time in the 30 years that I've been involved in intelligence and intelligence-related topics. I have to confess that I'm probably as puzzled and unsure about the recommendations I would make today, however, as at any time. And so I thought um, I would explain a little bit to you about why one who has spent the last 30 years really heavily focused on this still finds herself with such a lack of clarity on what my concerns are. First, I think the changes in our society, our world, and our national security threats are really remarkable. I don't think they've ever been more dynamic at any point in our history. And so this really means that reaching societal consensus about how we balance government power and transnational security threats consistently governing principles based, of course, on our Constitution is even harder. And I would say that all of this is going to require a change of culture. And as we know, nothing is more difficult. I'll say a little bit more about what I mean when I say culture. I hope, however, that in this, I hope, interdisciplinary conversation, we have an anthropologist. If so, or if not, next time. <laughs> because I think we have something to learn there. In any event, um, Consider the context in which the changes that we are trying to uh, debate, discuss, and arrive at occur. First of all, I think we've lost faith in multiple aspects of our democracy. Secondly, we don't understand the technology which underpins our safeguards and empowers our threats. And third, we're unclear about the nature of the new generation of threats we face. What's needed in all of this is indeed a serious national conversation. And so this gathering and others like it are really terribly important. In fact, next week, uh, Chris Inglis and I will be participating in a similar conference for over 400 national security lawyers. This one will be, or that one will be, at the classified level. But it suggests to you that the same kinds of issues are being debated within our government as we're debating here. Now, I would interject at this point, as others have said, that although I continue to serve on several governmental bodies, among them the DNI Senior Advisory Group, where I've served for three DNIs, obviously my comments are my own personal comments and not those of anybody else with whom I may be working. So Jose, who's quite a taskmaster, I've come to learn, has asked me to speak about first are intelligence agencies adequately structured and empowered to confront current and future transnational threats? Second, how do we ensure intelligence agencies fulfill their mission consistent with the true uh, nature of law and constitutional and human rights guarantees that, that characterize our nation? And finally, he's also asked me to anticipate, maybe even predict, uh, Jamil Jaffer's final keynote remarks, which unfortunately I won't be able to hear about the fundamental tensions about the balance between security and freedom. I'm going to begin with that third question. Frankly, I don't believe that there need be or is a trade-off between security and individual freedom. I think the trade-off is between security and safety. I do not see, then, individual freedom as really a part of the balance that we're talking about. I think our government intelligence agencies and our political leadership are committed to protecting individual privacy and liberty, no matter how we make the decisions on the balance of safety and security. On the other hand, and I think we've already had some useful comments, we haven't tended to think about safety as part of what's in this balance. And so I think it's important that we do so for a succession of DNIs. I've heard frustration about the fact that all of our intelligence assets have been required by political leadership to be focused on one threat, not many threats that confront us. And so all assets then being focused on 400 terrorists, as opposed to looking at perhaps the incredible destabilizing features of things like global climate change. I won't quote who has said that, but I think you might find it interesting that those are the kinds of conversations that one does here in circles in the intelligence community. Now, 
Jose has also asked that the conversation that I'm going to participate in here go beyond, and ours, our more general conversation, go beyond the current surveillance debate. But I think we have to be frank. But for Edward Snowden's revelations and resulting, I would say, highly effective disinformation campaign, I don't think we'd be having this conversation. And indeed, one person lamented the fact that we only make decisions in a crisis. Well, guess what? That's the way our democracy, and probably any democracy, works. It's only a crisis that causes us to focus on the most critical topics. I think if you wanted to have a little history lesson for a moment, you might look at the vicissitudes of our intelligence capabilities across history. We can see that oftentimes public policy really does lag behind security needs. And a classic example, of course, would be Secretary Stimson closing down our code-breaking facilities in the late 20s with the comment, gentlemen, don't read other gentlemen's mail. Well, he may have caused, he may have been uh, in a position to regret that in World War II, where it didn't appear that gentlemen were involved in some of the security threats that we were talking about. I've got a personal example here, too, which I thought I would just quickly share with you. Um, you know, it's an interesting thing when you come, as I did from a background that was steeped in litigation purely on the domestic side of the house, and suddenly you're thrown into a new world. It was uh, quite a cultural shock for me, and perhaps because I was early to the question of how do we work with intelligence, foreign intelligence, uh, intelligence on the one hand and law enforcement on the other, I was asked to co-chair a panel in 1992 that looked at the relationship between intelligence and law enforcement. And out of that committee work, half drawn from the Department of Justice and the FBI, the other half from the intelligence community, I became convinced, and with me a number of colleagues, that we really had a major threat that had to be dealt with. And I became a real nuisance. I spoke and hectored wherever I could. Well, it turned out that my efforts were not successful. It needed 9-11 to bring some of the changes to bear that I had hoped we might have anticipated. I think the point there is, is clear, but let's think about where we are right now. Cybersecurity and infrastructure protection may well be the principal threats we face going forward. So what external events is, is it going to require for action in order to do the kind of protection of our infrastructure systems that we really must have if we don't want to contemplate a world without, for example, electricity? Think about what that might mean. Or, for example, what if the GPS system went down? Now, there you have some things to think about. I think we'd be thrown into chaos rather quickly. And yet, Congress seems to be uh, gridlocked. We haven't taken obvious steps that we might. And so, on the one hand, while I deplore Snowden's actions and really the bonanza of harm to our government and nation, which I think he has single-handedly achieved, we ought not to fail to take advantage of the crisis he's created. Today, however, our national response really mystifies me. I hope I'm not unkind if I say it really seems like a self-destruction born of a paroxysm of misdirected virtue. Questions over power answers for me. What justifies Snowden's theft of documents followed by his manipulated release to his press agents in ways that seem designed to embarrass and thwart US policy in violation of his duty and with imperfect understanding of the documents and programs he's released. Why has the press been so easily co-opted to believe that each new release is worthy of reporting, intimating that our government is acting in ways inconsistent with national values? And why is there such an outcry about the government's role in the 702 and 215 programs when even the most critical reports recognize that no misconduct has occurred in the management of these programs? They've been managed, in fact, with scrupulous care, I think, if you read any of these reports, and it, it leaves one to wonder, is there something else going on? Finally, what do, why is it that so many of the public seem to distrust the government's handling of data and yet don't have the same kinds of questions of the private sector, which I would suggest is much more aggressively mining data? Now, I haven't yet read the uh, report by John Podesta that came out a day or so ago, but perhaps uh, he'll be telling us something about the answer to that question. Whether or no, I think the White House is wise to say what's really going on here is a confusion about what this new world of data means to us, whether it's national security or in the private sector. 
In any event, I'd suggest to you that a lot of the answers um, to these questions that you see in the public, public press today, in the popular uh, media, are really based more on fiction and not on fact. And that, unfortunately, is really the hallmark of an effective disinformation campaign, which is what I really think very important. Our response, then, ought to be to make a much closer look, take a much closer look at the facts. Do have a problem here? Okay. It's as bad as I said, isn't it? Now yeah. I'm whispering. Okay. So our response really ought to be to take a much closer look at the facts involved so that we can derive some lessons learned to inform future choices. To do this, and I think one person has already anticipated my recommendation, we need a set of research topics on which all parts of our national brain trust, both those in academia as well as those in government service, can collaborate in finding solutions. And this is long overdue, but certainly conferences like this, I believe, are the beginning. So we need to look then at deeper causes and meanings of the crisis that Snowden has created. It's only in this way that we're going to be able to answer and propose solutions to the first of Jose's two questions. Are intelligence agencies adequately structured and empowered to confront current and future transnational threats? Frankly, my short answer is I don't believe they are. On the other hand, maybe they don't, maybe we don't want them to be. And here I listened with great interest to what Professor Seti said. Maybe we don't want to set our tolerance for risk at zero when it comes to existential threats, even as we set it at less than zero when we come to our law enforcement uh, responses. In any event, the nature of our threats is going to be part of what I think we have to look at closely. What do we know? Well, first, from 9-11, we know that national security threats are no longer exclusively coming from nation states. And you've already heard a great deal about this. So there are groups and individual actors who are armed, potentially, with the kind of existential destructive force we used to associate only with the Soviet Union's arsenal of weapons. Part of, of course, what's happened is that that arsenal of weapons of mass destruction has been decentralized into a resulting, probably less competent, group of former Soviet Union states. And so the differences between unknown individuals and nation states really does bedevil our government organizations and the legal and policy structures which govern them. And here I'll insert what I thought was a fascinating remark by an impressive senator from New Mexico, Martin Heinrich happens to be an engineer. And about two weeks ago at a similar conference, he delivered a very thoughtful set of comments. I wouldn't say I agreed with all of them, but they were really worth listening to until the very end where he commented, advising the government, it should go after terrorists, not citizens. Right. Isn't that the problem? It's a good idea, but which is which? And that's, I think, where our problem lies. Unlike armies, Terrorists do not wear their names and affiliations on their uniforms. Second, threats are no longer confined within national borders, and that, of course, is core to what we're talking about today. And our border is particularly large and porous. You've already heard others more currently informed than I am about the problems of the handoff between national security and domestic agencies as these threats move across borders. But I would emphasize that the cultural differences that we have inculcated in different agencies by design makes this a very hard problem. And it isn't something where change comes quickly, as I've said before. Um, our domestic law enforcement agencies are based on a set of rules, uh, if you will, a, a focus that is specific in response to actions. In contrast, our intelligence agencies work in a much different context. They look broadly. They try to paint pictures. And the two don't fit easily together. And so these different approaches, then, are ones which we're going to have to understand and figure out how we integrate. I used to talk about the difference between law enforcement and intelligence in a shorthand. I referred to the Galapagos Island syndrome. Common roots in gathering information, but they can no longer interbreed. They really can't communicate. It's improved, I think, but I don't think it's quite where it needs to be yet. And then when we add to that the fact that we have so many law enforcement agencies that are state and local, you can see that the problem is compounded. Now, why would we design such a government? 
mean, goodness, it's a loose confederation of warring tribes, isn't it? The answer is because we don't trust government, and so we break power up into bits so that we can be sure that it doesn't become monolithic and oppressive, oppressive but therein lies the dilemma. Um, I'd say, too, that the competency, now here I'm really on thin ice, and please don't quote me, the competency among our various agencies is not all at an equally high standard. And so part of the problem then comes in the fact that NSA is seen as prima inter pares. But how are we then going to take advantage of the technology, the incredible expertise that NSA has, and distribute it to other agencies that may also want to take advantage of it? Shall we simply duplicate what NSA has achieved over a number of years? Chris will tell us what the budget would be requiring us to do that. Um, I don't think it's even worth talking about. It's not going to happen. So how then do we share? Um, and where do we place certain responsibilities for this new world that we're looking at? This is a, a quite a debate and an important one, I think. Um, I think also that coordination, as I mentioned, remains um, really a, a critical con concern. Uh, next, we come third to the cyberspace environment, which really has transformed our threat environment. It offers increasing opportunities for a continuum of damage from nuisance to international crime to truly existential threats. It layer levels the playing field between unknown individuals around the globe and known national actors. Cyberspace is also an attack-rich environment. Every aspect of modern life, as I mentioned, depends on cyber technology. And yet, the protections in place to protect against such attacks are wholly inadequate. And I've mentioned the paralysis in Congress, but I should add, too, that this is not a solution that government can achieve on its own, because as we know, we've privatized so much of our infrastructure. And so the private industry component to our solution is essential. And yet here we have, of course, a partner motivated by cost and profit and so on, and they've not been willing to spend the money for the protections we would ideally have, nor has government through Congress been willing to mandate them. And so therein lies a dilemma. But it's really, I think, the fourth threat that has my attention here. And this is where I see the greatest challenge. It's in our own national culture. In the words of Pogo, I think we've met the enemy and it's us. And I see five parallel developments which seem to have created a social context, context which is making effective choices and solutions particularly difficult. First, I believe we have become something of the center of our own circumference. And by this I mean we have a rather uninformed perspective of the world beyond our borders. Perhaps it's because 70 years of peace at home combined with limited exposure to national service in the population has immunized us from any fear or understanding that others may not always wish us well. Our appreciation for our role in the world and what we can hope to achieve as its remaining superpower, in my view, is a bit cloudy. Second, I don't think we understand, as a nation, our system of government, its structures and approaches. Never mind the more nuanced discussion I've just been engaging in as how law enforcement uh, and national security and intelligence are designed to be fundamentally different. Combining the two capabilities might be the ideal solution, but it's obviously not a good idea if we care about our system of government and its constitutional bases. There are no simple solutions. I think you get that point from what I've said so far. And yet, the electorate seems impatient and ill-informed and pardon me, demands immediate response and is seemingly unprepared to accept risk. Now, I think this problem of uninformed or ill-informed public is uh, in part created by what appears to be a drawdown in civics education generally, but also direct involvement in security topics through military service. I gather one in 50 now serves certainly contributes to this as well. Third, we've become something of a talk show nation. Everybody's opinion seems to have equal weight. 
And we also expect that we will have the opportunity to participate directly in all decisions, just as these days I'm asked to figure out how my computer will work. There is, I think, a tendency in the political arena as well. And yet, as I've already said, we don't have the requisite education to participate, I think, effectively. As an aside, um, I think that we see some of this in the international arena as well. And so some recent treaty advances have really not been the result of nation states coming together and deciding on issues, but rather individuals. One of the speakers has mentioned that we're going to be seeing more of that, and I think that's true, and it would take me back to the point that if we don't have a better informed electorate, I think we face serious problems. Fourth, there's a, uh, a narrative out there that I'll call the government is the enemy, despite, in my judgment, having the finest government in modern history, trust in our government, which is really the coin of the realm, has declined precipitously in the last 50 years. Now, I think this trend has been encouraged by a media which competes and survives on suspicion and scandal, on an overactive entertainment media which promotes a narrative of evil government actors, and, but let's be frank, past misdeeds and poor choices which provide the basis to color reactions to challenges to government reactions and actions, no matter what the facts may be. Snowden's actions and the press reporting of them, of course, are my prime example of this unfortunate uh, stew. Five, technology has outstripped law and regulation, never mind our understanding. And so the ability of people and their elected representatives to understand new technologies and then fashion effective regulations of it is wanting. And I'll add here that I think one of the problems this creates then is as we try to apply a somewhat antiquated set of laws and definitions to modern circumstances is the result of a rather strained set of interpretations which also appear to lack credibility. Now I'm moving to conclusion, Jose, so probably I'll be almost within time. But I don't want to stop without addressing your second question, and that is how to ensure that intelligence agencies fulfill their missions consistent with the rule of law and constitutional and human rights guarantees. Well, honestly, I don't know. Um, I've read, as I've mentioned, the description of the Privacy and Civil Liberties Board um, as it reviewed the 702 and 215 programs, and I fail to see how particularly the 215 program could be more aggressively monitored to protect the rights of US persons. I wonder, by the way, how many other people have really studied this description, and if so, what they might suggest. But I know that more than simply shrugging my shoulders is required, and so I've tried to think about what could be done to reassure the public, notwithstanding the lack of trust that is so widespread that it sometimes thinks nothing will work. Now, my thoughts are personal, but maybe they'll be helpful in stimulating your own thoughts. First of all, you know, I was really a very suspicious child of the 60s when I arrived at NSA. In my over a decade in uh, the intelligence community, I had to rethink what I had learned in my first decade where I litigated a series of not just civil rights and civil liberties cases, but draft resistance cases as well. Before I could make too much of an embarrassment of myself, uh, I kept two thoughts to myself, but they were these. One, no one would arrive at NSA better prepared to protect the rights of US persons than I. And secondly, the military, and one in five then was military, both in the agency at large and my office, was a junk item from whom I would get no help. Both were wrong. I found my office being more careful than I would have been, and by the way, a succession of subsequent general counsels have had the same conclusion. So it wasn't just that I was asleep at the wrong point in my constitutional law class. But secondly, I found that the lawyers who were military jag lawyers in my office were outstanding. They may have been among the best. Well, why do I tell you that story? I tell you that because in that personal exposure, I learned something that few people have a chance to learn when they come, as I did, very much from the outside. 
And I was reminded of that when I arrived at the CIA in the, in the 1990s. Um, I'd always been interested in, in having as aggressive an uh, internship program as possible, and I was delighted that one was already in place when I arrived at the CIA. And, there, and of course, I could choose them. And there was one particularly suspicious young man who said to me, well, I hear what you say, but I don't believe it. I mean, you're just not showing me everything. And of course, I wasn't showing him everything. And I thought about that hard. What, in what way could I reassure him that indeed it was an agency he could trust? And what I've come then to the conclusion of is that while certainly it's possible to um, tinker around and find technical and legal oversight structures which might be even better than the ones we have now, that's, that's always something we should keep in mind. The real issue, I think, is people and getting to know and understand the remarkable people that we have working for us in our intelligence agencies. And so the dilemma for me becomes, how do we achieve a much deeper engagement? Conferences like this are a start, but they're not enough. And so that's something I'd be particularly interested in hearing your thoughts on. Now, I said I was going to try and um, just add one or two comments because that would be the end of my formal remarks about what I've heard um, this morning and yesterday, and, and I don't want to filibuster here. But I do have to make a comment about oversight activities by the Congress. I thought it was 55 agencies that had oversight responsibility of the Department oh, of Homeland yeah. Security. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Very few congressmen do what we want. And that's a travesty. They're not, whether because they're too busy raising money or other reasons, as fully and currently, the language of the statute, informed as they should and could be. What can we do? We can bring the horse to water, but we cannot make him or her drink. And the second thing I wanted to mention is a word about the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Um, when Jim Bulsey came on as the uh, DCI, he said to me, we're never losing any of these. And I explained at some length, based on my NSA background, why that was. I explained how the review went. And you know, it was scraped and, you know, kind of revisited by countless lawyers. And there was all this. And so he said, well, if we're not losing some, then we're not being aggressive enough. And I said, no, 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 no. Our, our role has always been not to get to the edge. You know, stay far away from, from the river so you don't ever get even close. You, you want to preserve public trust. No, 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 he said, push ahead. Well, you know, what is, it, what is the expression General Hayden had? You want to have chalk on your boots? I'm not much of a football player, but I think I get the point. I don't know. I think we've always played it pretty careful with the FISA court. Now, earlier you heard me in the question and answer period, however, um, mention um, something about my role as a member of the Public Interest Declassification Board, which is now just ending. Uh, one thing I have felt strongly about in the board with me is that the opinions of the FISA court should have been released. Uh, when the first one came out and it was a sealed opinion, I was horrified. And I did a little op-ed that Judge Royce Lambert, then a member of the board, and believe me, someone who takes no prisoners and speaks truth to power, did me the great honor of making multiple copies of it and then sending around. He said, I couldn't write this, but do read it. I thought, well, this is one way to get your thoughts out, have a judge circulate it for you. But the point is, I think that was a mistake, and it's a mistake that is costly because our courts educate us. And when we don't have that availability for their review, for their education, for their calibration of where is the public with whatever the legal standard is we're dealing with, we lose something tremendously. It has always been a problem for the intelligence community. The, the amount of authority is really rather small. You've got the steel seizure case from, what, 1952 or four, and other than that, you know, good luck. There's just not a lot. And so this, I think, has been a real problem, and it should have been released early on, and it should now be a decision that's made just across the board. And I would say, similarly, the regulatory framework that governs our intelligence agencies ought to be released. And here I think I speak for my colleagues on the PIBB. I want to say one word about the PIBB, and then I promise I'll stop. 
We have published, I think, at this juncture, three reports. Um, we are aggressively of the view that the classification system is broken badly. Attention needs to be given to that. We shouldn't be declassifying records that are 25 years old, well, we should, but we ought to be focusing on what the priorities for declassification are now to educate our public. And who are the members of this board? Half appointed by the president and half by the Congress, and of the nine, I would say seven you've described, myself included, as a bunch of mossbacks. I mean, if this is something being said by people who are, if you will, insiders, it tells you that we do have a problem in not getting information out. And so I think at the end of the day, in not having declassified more, we've created our own new kind of security risk. Well, that's what we used to say in a court argument, I think more than a, a fair opening, and now I'll, I'll open it up for a few minutes of questions if there's still time. But I thank you very much. For this, uh, actually, my husband thanks you. He is so tired of hearing about this at dinner. <laughs> and so every chance I get to speak, he insists. <laughs> so that'll be my chance to slip away. Make a comment, although I'm going to speak in a few minutes. You mentioned how you went into the NSA as a child of the 60s with the instinctive suspicion and cynicism that all of us in that era had towards law enforcement, police officers, and so forth. I went from being a law teacher in the ivory tower to being a US magistrate. And I had the same anticipation about the FBI, DA, ATF agents who would be submitting search warrant applications to me. And quite candidly, within about six months, I realized how seriously they took not just their jobs and their responsibilities, but their commitment to fundamental constitutional principles and the law. It is not a career-enhancing move for any federal law enforcement officer, and I'm sure it's true as well for intelligence officers, to have a court, in one case, suppress evidence because you made a mistake. And likewise, I'm sure, in the, in the security area, uh, if you make a mistake, it's not a career-enhancing move. If you cross a line that is there. When I joined the Foreign Intelligence Defense Court in 2002, I had exactly the same kind of suspicion. And it didn't take me many sessions there to realize uh, exactly what you're saying. And I think that it's unfortunate that the public doesn't have that perception of the people who are on the ground who've got a difficult and demanding and sometimes dangerous job to do when they come to a court requesting its assistance so that they can employ a certain method, whether it's search warrant or Title III uh, order or uh, FISC order, uh, I really think it's unfortunate that the default impulse is not to give them the credit for the kind of integrity and commitment to fulfilling the oath that they all take to uphold, defend, and protect the Constitution and laws of the United States. And so I was, I'd like to endorse that since nobody else had a question. I'll give you that endorsement. More I agree than with welcome. You. Yeah, it, I, I think one of the things I learned that um, I was one of a number, of, of a generation, and that the lack of understanding I had was something that was broadly shared. And I, I will say that about two years after I had, an agent had been with me for about six months, he came back for a party, he said, you know, magistrate, we had a couple beers in the evening. I was with the Bureau for about six months here in Toledo before I realized your first name was not that goddamn. So, in any event. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but also, one final thing, please. I, I think it's important. The, the crucial need upon which government officials depend when they approach any court to display the utmost candor and forthrightness. Any of you who are lawyers who have ever appeared in front of a judge know what it would mean for a judge to conclude that you had not been 100% straight with that judge. Because next time you come back with that judge, it's going to be a lot more difficult. And that, too, I think is a crucial component of the relationship between uh, the, uh, the agency and the Justice Department presenting applications and those agents who appear in front of the FISC. And if I could take that comment and kind of spin it in a different direction, I think I, I've made much of the fact that why does the public not trust us. I think the missteps 
that were made in the church and well, revealed in the church and pike period. But I have to say also, um, I think a number of things done in the Bush administration, uh, and I'm not speaking about the surveillance program specifically, have colored the uh, context in which thoughts about these programs um, go forward. And it's not an easy thing to restore trust. It's very much like when you um, remodel your house, you tear down a wall in an afternoon, building it up again is a longer process. Sorry to cut in. Oh, that's all right. I had the chance to think of my question a little okay. bit longer. <laughs> um, and this has to do with uh, your, your the, uh, early distinction between uh, safety and uh, security. And uh, I've been thinking throughout this whole conference about the difference between, uh, and, and maybe this is what you were getting at, between uh, what many of the speakers have talked about as risk, which, uh, and, and many of the speakers have talked about as threat, threat being apparently quite immediate, and the organizations of our intelligence community, and certainly maybe of the White House and, and other agencies in Congress, not looking at longer term and bigger threats to our safety. And I wonder if you just, if you have some reflections on that, on are there reorganizations, are there um, initiatives that need to be taken, uh, National uh, Academy of Science reports that look at that, how do, how do we go at that? Well, I, I think that may be a question better for, for Chris Inglis when he um, has the opportunity to talk with you later on this afternoon from his background um, as the deputy at NSA. But, but I will say that um, it's very hard within the legal framework that intelligence operates to resist the kind of political policy pressures that will come from a White House, and there have been, it's not just this White House, and saying we absolutely cannot tolerate a terrorist event domestically, do everything you can, and that then causes a great shifting of assets. We can't cover everything equally everywhere. And so I, you may have heard my comment that at least one DNI uh, you know, lamented kind of out loud to no one in particular how frustrating it was not to be able to look at some of the much deeper strategic threats that are going to build over time. It's, it's a limitation, I think, of, of our, our system. And I don't know that it has a structural solution. <laughs> is there an outside solution? That is there, uh, can, can, can the public, the NGO, the public, the university, the social system? Well, this may be a bit Pollyanna-ish, but I will say that, I'm with you on that. Uh, OK, I came to the conclusion at NSA that um, our brain trust had been halved. You know, Chicken Little and the Ostrich was the way I described it. Someone else mentioned the ostrich. Um, that the academic community really didn't think there was much of a threat. It's okay. You know, and and the, the intelligence community was just, you know, absolutely frozen with, with fear about what was going on. Now, this is still at the kind of tail end of the Cold War. And it appeared to me, my armchair assessment, and that's why I said, where is the anthropologist in the room? that there had been a real culture breakdown or shift as a result of the Vietnam War. So there was a great divide. And we weren't talking to one another. And indeed, one of the reasons I wanted to come into an academic setting after this unusual career, I've had checkered careers that I described it, was that I wanted to see what I could do. And one of my happier accomplishments was to create within the Association of American Law Schools a new section on um, national security, law, and policy, and also to create um, a peer, refer, peer re, pardon me, I'll get it out, peer-reviewed journal, which we then moved to Georgetown because I felt that the academic community, now this is in the legal um, academy, had so much more to offer than what was happening. And I think that would be true across all of the disciplines. The difficulty is, I believe, how best to engage. And I think, and Chris, you'll have to help me here, this is new. And so I think that the intelligence community is still kind of thinking through what are the, the ways to do this. You can't bring every one of our 350 million citizens you know, into a position as I had, but there ought to be ways that we can better reach out to the leadership, uh, particularly the academic community, and to, to create a better dialogue with them, and then to take advantage of the extraordinary things that they know or could be, could be looking at 
And so a research agenda, certainly in the legal world, I think is imperative. We really need to have thoughtful discussions, much as have happened today. Now, I would fault a couple of the papers by saying, oh, you got the facts wrong. You know what? They got a lot right. And those facts can be corrected in conversation, and then the research can be improved even beyond where it is. And I think much of this can be done in the open world. I'm on a bit of a, a hobby horse here. <laughs> Thanks for the question. So I, I really appreciated your comments about the classification system and it being broken. Um, I found when I was in government, there were so many things I would have liked to have been able to do, but because the underlying information was classified, I couldn't. And so things like information sharing with partners, my office was in charge of atrocity prevention and response. And so we would learn of something that was unfolding somewhere, and we literally couldn't do anything about it. We couldn't out the person. We couldn't name and shame. We couldn't work with NGOs who were on the ground, humanitarian partners. We couldn't work with partners who were had better connections in the field to put pressure on governments or actors who were responsible for those. And so you know, the question comes down to what would it take to revise that system? I think some of it is cultural, as you said. Some of it is a fear of you know underclassifying something and getting in trouble for that. Some of it is just simply habit. It's just easier to slap a classification on something than really work through the authorities and to figure out whether or not the presumption should be it shouldn't be classified. Rather, the presumption is that it is classified. So I'd love to get your thoughts on, on what could be done to, to fix that system. Well, I should just refer you to our reports, which are available online. It's the Public Interest Declassification Board. But I, I, nonetheless, I will say a word or two. Um, I, I think that um, money is part of this, and technology is the other part. And we, there are ways we're convinced that we can use technology to be much more efficient in um, how we identify documents that really are terribly sensitive and must be classified um, or maintained in a classified setting. Uh, but all of this does take money, and we haven't treated it as a terribly uh, high priority. Now, um, one of you, I think in the back, asked the question about, well, what about um, using the, um, uh, what am I trying to say, the, the kind of APA. the APA, yeah. And I said, well, you know, we kind of tried something like that. Here's what we tried it on. We tried to get advice as to what the priorities for declassification ought to be. And we didn't get response. We actually offered some suggestions as to what we thought might be valuable. <laughs> but the way our classification system now works, much of the resource is put towards the Freedom of Information Act. Well, the Freedom of Information Act, I think we all, you know, kind of wrap ourselves in the flag and say it's wonderful, but it's not very productive for what we're trying to do. Because a lot of it is just individual stuff. A class, you know, a teacher may say to her class, okay, now let's see how government works and, you know, file a request and you got to answer. So it's not strategic. And I think the other part of this is that the, the classification reforms that happened pretty quickly in the Clinton administration were really um, time based. And so it's, you know, 10 years, 15 years, whatever. But it's really more of a substance base, I think, in this post-Cold War period. We need to understand as much as we can about a very different way of doing business. The final thing I'll say is that, and I, I, someone has mentioned this already, but doing business in the open is going to have to be something we think through. And here I do think there's a role for our academic friends to, to help us. You know, we have a system designed from the Cold War, and I'm not the best person to speak to this, but it was designed really, if you think of the pyramid, only the very top was open. Everything else was, was closed, denied areas, dominated. And so now yes. it's kind of flipped around, I think. The, the pyramid's been reversed. And how do we adjust to that? And do we, as you suggest, totally flip it around and say, you know, when in doubt, throw it out, as opposed to protect it? But do think about the, the punitive measures, the Kyle Lott Act, for example response to what happened at one of the national labs has been a you know a real slowdown and a real downer actually as to how people feel about this. So I think this is certainly an area where we could use a little bit more informed public support, I think. I think it's a very important topic. Thank you. 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 Um, for your remarks. I have a question which I think you might be uniquely positioned to enlighten us about. I think a lot of the mistrust, the public mistrust um, of our intelligence community, of the agencies, is sourced in the rhetoric of the top level administrators. 
um, the directors of an agency or of administration when called before Congress. There's a perception that at certain times Congress has been misled or that perhaps they are speaking or operating with impunity in real time, that if there has been a lapse, um, it will be found out after the fact. And so what I'm wondering about is a little bit of the procedure, the process for preparing those administrators when they are called before Congress, whether Congress is allowed to know everything, whether there indeed are questions that due to separation of powers concerns or a mandate, they're not going to be able to answer on that record. And as legal counsel for uh, the two top intelligence agencies, I'm wondering what the process is before, or when you get that subpoena, before the administrator or the director goes before a congressional panel what they can say. Well, you hope you don't get a subpoena. Indeed. <laughs> because when you're at that point, things have really broken down. You know, I could give you an historic view and also the view that I get in some of the bodies that I sit on now, but a better person, better person would either be the panel or Ms. English if you'd like to take that question, because it's a very yeah. important one. I can only give you my impression, and that is that I think the process I, there's more blame to cast on Congress than I'm afraid there is on the intelligence community. And sometimes there are questions asked that it's very difficult to answer in a public forum. One, because you may not have full information right there at the moment, or it may touch on classified programs. And when that happens, immediately one is in a position where you appear it can be dissembling. It's probably something that should have been asked in a classified setting. But the real dilemma I see is that Congress is simply too busy with other things and at this point too dysfunctional between the various parties and their components to take the time needed to become fully informed. And so the questions they ask are sometimes, you know, they're just wrong questions. It's very hard to answer a wrong question effectively. Do you want to? I mean, I think that's right. I mean, I say any question that the panel might be looking at that you might just find it. This would be my opportunity to thank you again and uh, sit down.